Hi, welcome to the OpenMP workshop presented by the NSF Succeed program. This was originally a one-day hands-on workshop that you can view at your own pace. To get access to the slides and exercises used by the original students, look at the link below. Uh, this last talk is going to be covering M OpenMP 4 and 5, which uh, you might be inclined to think of as just uh, oh, the latest additions to the OpenMP, the growing OpenMP capabilities. And that would be a fair assumption, uh, be my guess if I didn't know better, but I do know better. And so OpenMP 4 and 5 are kind of different terms to address a very different need with OpenMP, uh, in particular uh, accelerators. So OpenMP was originally designed to, to replace this POSIX threads, this idea of just each, you know, cores have their threads doing their thing, all the stuff we've been doing today. Uh, and each, so far today, everything that we've looked at has been, uh, each thread could go its own way. You can see, especially at the low-level stuff, that each thread is, is very capable of going in its own direction and doing its own thing. As I said, on, a, on an Xbox, for example, the thread, one thread can be doing the AI, another thread can be doing collision detection. So there's no uh, assumptions about the threads being tied together or synchronized or anything else. Uh, and OpenMP was built around that kind of model, that kind of assumption. But then, came along, these GPUs, which I mentioned in our intro talk here, have a very, very different architecture. Most notably, they have a separate memory for the GPU and for the CPU. This is the most obvious thing when you start trying to program them, and that's why I said we have to cram this data back and forth. So if we look at uh, our weather model, for example, or our Laplace code. So we look at our, our Laplace code that we're doing right now with the temperature. If we want to do it on a GPU, and we do, we have a GPU version of the code that runs in OpenACC, the, the very same code that we started with serial code with a GPU version of it. As a matter of fact, it happens to be sitting in your exercises directory under OpenACC if you really wanted to look at it. And it looks remarkably like an OpenMP code. But what it does have to do is it has to move data from the CPU to the GPU to operate on it. And then sometimes it has to move it back so that you can do things on the CPU or output it at the very least. This is not something that we've had to worry about with OpenMP. We've just had a shared memory space. Now we've got this divided memory space. So GPUs are not CPUs at all. The memory management is, like I said, the most obvious thing. The, the next most obvious thing is if you look at any kind of schematic of the architecture, no matter what level of detail it is, immediately it's apparent that there are thousands of cores. There are a lot more cores on a GPU than are, you know, the, the Xeon processors we've been using today are pretty powerful with their 28 cores. And that is a pretty big machine. You know most of you can't afford to buy those processors. Instead, you're working on, say, four core machines or whatnot, uh, and, and happy to have those, right? So thousands of cores seems to be mind-boggling, but it's because those cores aren't independent x86-type architecture cores. They're very, very simple-minded cores that have to be slaved together at different levels. There's a hierarchy to them. Uh, and so that's, they're, they're not entirely independent. So it's not like they've managed to fit 2,000 Pentium processors on, on this single chip on this card. Uh, on the other hand, they can launch very, very lightweight threads. And what I mean by that is that so far uh, today, as we've been working through our problems, we've looked at threads that, well, for our Laplace code, a single thread of our, say, 28 threads works on uh, tens of thousands of elements in our metal plate. And even then, you'd like it to be more. You'd like it to work on millions of elements at a time. You'd never launch a thread uh, to work. Well, you could try it. You could certainly do the experiment. You'll find it's incredibly inefficient to launch uh, a very small problem. Say our Laplace code was 10 by 10. It was 100 elements. And we launched 28 threads. It would be such a slowdown over the serial code because the time to start the threads up and to stop them and to set everything up doesn't remotely justify operating on in the case of 28 threads and 100 elements, you know, four elements a piece. That makes no sense. So OpenMP works on the assumption your threads are going to be around a long time and have a lot of work to do. GPUs, on the other hand, with their very simple-minded cores, excel at threads only having, uh, being very lightweight, only having maybe a, a handful of math operations to do before they're done and go look for another piece of work. So on a GPU, it's perfectly acceptable and not at all inefficient to have a thread launch that only does a small number of iterations of math operations, and then it's done. So GPUs have a very, very different architecture. Uh, however, when GPUs first came out and were all CUDA-based, NVIDIA basically started the whole GPU accelerator uh, endeavor, uh, and their proprietary approach to programming them, which is called CUDA, 
has become the dominant way, the vast majority of stuff that exists at the moment, library-wise and everything, is done in CUDA. When CUDA came out, it was, there was no alternative to it, so a lot of work was done in CUDA, and people quickly came to the realization they were writing lots of boilerplate code and doing a lot of simple-minded stuff that compilers are good at doing. Uh, so if any of you out there are CUDA programmers, you know that you spend a lot of time you know, with boilerplate cut and paste code and, and tiling things. Like d d Compilers figured out how to do that decades and decades ago. So uh, people quickly realized that this is not a productive way to spend their time. It's not gaining them efficiency to do that simple-minded stuff. And so what would an alternative be? Well, the directive-based approach used by OpenMP was pretty well established at that point in time, very successful, and had an obvious mapping to, to uh, GPUs. So that's exactly what happened was uh, the OpenACC com oh, committee was spun out of the OpenMP committee. So OpenMP had been established by this time, we were up to OpenMP 3, 3.1, and was fairly mature. Wasn't a whole lot that needed to be added to it. So far, everything we've done today has been OpenMP 3.1. Uh, so OpenMP 3.1 was well established, and OpenACC, this directive based approach to GPU programming, was brand new. And so <clears throat> it needed to evolve rapidly and adapt and, and be sorted out. And it's not the kind of thing you want to do inside of an existing standard, which you hope is slow moving and well considered. So instead they spun off OpenACC, there's this parallel fork here to work on <clears throat> rapidly figuring out well, how you wanted to do this stuff. And the idea was that eventually, after it evolved, it could be merged back in, probably around OpenMP4 was the, the idea, and then things could march forward from there. Meanwhile, some other things happened. In particular, uh, GPUs caught on became very significant as they are today. They're the driving force behind a lot of the flops in HPC in general are just driven by GPUs. I showed you the top 10 list of the biggest machines in the world, a lot of GPUs in there, growing number. Uh, machine learning these days, which is uh, an incredibly huge field, rapidly evolving, is not just, not just, does not just use GPUs, and you can make a strong argument it only exists because GPUs have enabled it to exist, the ability to do teraflops of computing on a desktop. So GPUs became very important. And Intel recognized this. And Intel's approach to things that goes back decades is, that's important. How can we do that the way we do things? How can we do that with x86? Uh, and this, is, this has historically been uh, a, way, a big source of inspiration for them. Is how can we do something that's important and new with our x86 architecture? And that's the same idea that they brought to the table here with accelerators. They said, OK, accelerator is important. So how can we make? an accelerator that uses our approach to doing things. We can't do it the NVIDIA way with thousands of these simple cores. They know how to do that from doing video cards. That's a great way to process graphics, frame images. Uh, but we don't know how to do that as well. We do know how to do very well is make x86. So they decided to make a chip based on x86 cores instead of these simple cores. But instead of having thousands of them, as you can imagine, that's not possible to do. They decided they could put dozens of them on a single chip. So their first version of it, of their many integrated core mic architecture, which they have chosen to call Xeon Phi, just to confuse things. So the Xeon Phi line has nothing to do with the Xeon high-end processor line. So the Xeon Phi line, this is many integrated core architecture, and it is a bunch of x86 type chips, but simplified versions of them. They're not nearly as powerful as their you know, leading edge, or even as your common desktop x86. A lot of people used to think of them as Pentium class chips, but that's not fair because they have much better floating point performance than Pentium chips. So you could think of them as Pentium type uh, architecture for their single instruction stream, but uh, with modern 512 bit vector operations to allow them to do a much better job of math, floating point math, in particular double precision floating point math. So they put this together, and their first version of this looked like this it was a ring bus connecting a bunch of these Pentium type processors with vector add-ons that gave them a lot of math capability and they could put 60 of these in a chip and they worked uh, as an accelerator on a card. So they'd put these in a chip and then they'd be in a card like this. So here's your, you would buy this card, plug it in your machine, there's your PCI bus. On that card is this chip here and in this chip is 60 of these kind of things. So that was the first generation. Now the next generation uh, or, you know, the next serious generation, which is the current one that's, that's fairly new, Knight's Landing, looks like this. And it has uh, a couple of important features. I'll, I'll defer a few slides on it and make it very different. But Knight's Landing has 
60 some cores arranged in a tile, so they've given up the ring bus, now it's a tile type architecture, but it's the same idea. These are, are simpler processors, although they look a little bit more like Xeons now, uh, arranged in a 2D mesh uh, and sharing memory. So it's kind of like a cluster, an SMP cluster on a chip, if you will. Now the implications for this for OpenMP are that Intel uh, now in influencing the OpenMP standard, uh, and they have a strong influence on the OpenMP standard, uh, has found that it is maybe to their competitive advantage to make OpenMP work particularly well with Intel chips at the expense of everybody else. Meanwhile, NVIDIA is very much a driving force between, behind OpenACC, although these are both open standards. They really are true open standards, so you don't have to fear for that. They're not proprietary, no company can take them over, but obviously they have a lot of influence on the standards body when they provide most of the hardware behind what's, what's run on those. And the NVIDIA uh, standard, as, uh, NVIDIA cars have pretty much been behind driving OpenACC. As a matter of fact, the best OpenACC compiler is the PGI compiler we've been using here today. And so NVIDIA has pulled things in their direction a little bit to the point where right now they're not all that compatible with each other on certain features that are important. Uh, and so as a result, with OpenMP4, they did not come back together. And OpenMP4 has now moved on to 4.5 and 5 that we're going to look at here. But OpenMP4 is different than, uh, uh, than OpenACC. They're not the same thing. And OpenMP4 is almost entirely concerned not with improvements to OpenMP3 stuff that we've been looking at so far and multi-core use of Intel processors, for example. It's almost entirely concerned with using accelerators and moving data back and forth, memory management. The one thing we haven't touched on at all today because it's totally meaningless in a multi-core world. The chips that we're using here on your phone, on your laptop, uh, on bridges, uh, it's only important for accelerators, for things that you plug in. So the OpenMP4 standard has all these features to deal with data migration. We'll look at them in just a second here. But it sticks with the OpenMP, original OpenMP approach of saying, this is exactly what I want. I want you to parallelize this loop or I want you to move this data. And don't, don't ask me any questions. Compiler, just do what I say. OpenACC, because it's newer spec, uh, was built on the notion that compilers can be pretty smart and so maybe instead you just tell the compiler, here's something parallelizable, you figure out what to do with it. And by the way, if it's not parallelizable, tell me, don't do the wrong thing. Just tell me and that you object and don't parallelize it. So it'll run correctly, just not faster. So those are different approaches, they're a little bit different philosophy. So in OpenACC, you have a directive like the kernel directive. It looks like an OpenMP directive, but it just says parallelize this stuff. And if it doesn't parallelize, don't parallelize it then, don't break things, just run serial mode. Whereas we know with OpenMP, it's our responsibility to use the directives appropriately or it will break the code. If we don't put a private variable in the right place, the code will break and give us buggy results and we won't know it. So there are different approaches. OpenMP assumes that each one of the, the threads has complete control over itself. It's very flexible and independent. Uh, we've we've so far have, have programmed everything with that kind of approach. OpenACC instead recognizes that these simple-minded cores on an accelerator, on an NVIDIA type accelerator, have a lot of synchronization between them. It has to happen. Things aren't entirely independent. They're slaved together in lots of ways and there's a hierarchy. And so OpenACC doesn't allow complete independence at every level. So these differences have been enough to keep them from merging seamlessly back together. But the commonalities between them are very, very obvious. So for example, OpenMP4 has added in data migration commands. And the clauses for that, the directives for that, look like this. You have OMP, Pragma OMP, so this just tells you this is an OpenMP directive. But now, this target command says that we're looking at external devices. So now we can target devices. So this is the card that you plug in. Is device zero is probably the first card that you plug in. So we can target device zero. So this is the first clue that we're now dealing with the notion of a separate machine instead of one single machine sharing everything. So we target device zero, and then we have data that we can map to and from that device. So we can move data onto, in this case, an array called B. B here is actually the name of a variable. It's probably an array. So we can take an array B, and we can move it to and from, move the data across that PCI bus. So we have an OpenMP4, the main thing that we've gained are these data migration commands. Look an awful lot like OpenACC, if you know OpenACC, so much so that it's very clear that the two specs are you know, coming from the same source, the same roots. 
So we can move data back and forth. Now, I won't go into the specifics of this at all because accelerator programming is its own separate topic and a separate day for a reason. There's a reason we take we have a day for GPU programming. It's the same five hours that we've spent here because it does have a lot of its own special requirements to moving data back and forth and concerns that you have about that. But you can see that there's a lot of commonality here. So OpenMP4 is all about moving data back and forth. You can see these commands have a, like a one-to-one -one relationship between them. It's almost a matter of just an editor to, act, to convert one to the other. So things are very, very similar. There are some differences here, which again, without you having the benefit of knowing OpenACC, I can't go into specifically, but most of it revolves around the fact that, open, that, that NVIDIA devices, cards, have requirements for things to be dependent upon each other, and they're not entirely independent. And Intel devices, things are entirely independent. So there's, those differences are, are meaningful. So here's some simple loops and how they, they differ between uh, running OpenMP4 on an NVIDIA device, a simple loop like this that does nothing more than add two vectors together and multiply one of them. By vectors, I mean one-dimensional arrays. So here's a loop that just adds some arrays together. And here's what it looks like with OpenMP4 on an NVIDIA card. Uh, here's, a, here's a more head-to-head -head comparison. So here's OpenACC uh, and OpenMP4 on, here's OpenMP on a Xeon Phi. It's some pretty clean stuff. The parallel for loop should certainly look familiar to you. So here's a parallel for loop. It says run this loop in parallel on this accelerator card. The target commands that we just briefly talked about are the ones that say move the data on the device before you do that. So this works great on a Xeon Phi using OpenMP. Here's OpenMP on an NVIDIA card. It's a little less clean because we've really got to worry about how we break things up by hand. On the other hand, here's OpenACC on an NVIDIA card, and it's incredibly clean because we've got this kernels directive which says, hey, just do the right thing, and the compiler is capable of doing it. So you can see that things are similar in some ways, but distinctly different in others, and it's all about programming accelerators here. Now, if you try to make one code that goes across all the architectures, you can do it here, but you see things start to get a little bit less coherent than you would like. So at this point in time, the question, obvious question to, that you'd want to ask I, I, as a beginner programmer or even as an expert programmer just diving into this realm here is which one should I use, OpenACC or OpenMP if I want to program accelerators. So if you want to program single multi-core uh, you know, uh, Intel devices, OpenMP is the natural way to go. But if you want to program accelerators, which should you go? Which way should you go? Well, if you're going to use uh, Xeon Phi's, Intel devices, as a plug-in card, you're going to have to end up using Intel's compiler because that's the only ones that support it. So you can use Intel's compiler and use OpenMP4, and that's going to be a natural fit. If you're using NVIDIA GPUs as devices, then you're going to be using OpenACC because that's exactly what NVIDIA really supports and, and, uh, you know, and works at the end of the day, regardless of, of what the intention of the specs are. That's what's actually implemented and works. If you're using Knight's Landing, the newest generation, of these accelerators where they've taken it, so it's not an accelerator anymore, so the newest generation of Knight's Landing comes in two packages. One's an accelerator card that you can plug in, but Intel is also very much hoping to get away from that and to move the whole package onto a motherboard as just a single chip. So Knight's Landing has a mode where it's on the motherboard, and I'll show some pictures of that, uh, and you use it just as a, an SMP. You use it in the way that we've been programming, and you don't move data back and forth, and you're back to using OpenMP 3.1, in which case OpenMP is kind of moot. Does it really have a role anymore? Given that that's the future for Intel, they want to move away from the card, it makes OpenMP 4 and all the accelerator stuff for moving data back and forth look kind of already obsolete in Intel's roadmap. Uh, but at the moment, you should use the, the approach that's dictated by the hardware that you're most interested in or going to be using. So if you're going to use NVIDIA GPUs, use OpenACC. If you're going to use Intel uh, FIs, use OpenMP4 or, or 5, as we will talk about briefly uh, soon. Uh, if you're worried that you're going to make a huge mistake and invest in the wrong one, I hope the fact that, that even this glancing cursory overview of them shows you that they're very, very similar should give you some reassurance. Well, it might just give you the suspicion. Let me give you the reassurance that they're similar enough that translating between the two is more like you know a day's work with an editor of just, oh, translate this to that. I can't believe I have to waste my time doing this stuff. Instead of rewriting algorithms and, and, re, you know, and your code's all messed and your time's all wasted in developing the algorithm. It's really an exercise with the editor to switch back and forth more than it is uh, a matter of rejiggering re all of your algorithms. So 
Uh, that should be reassuring on one hand and a little bit frustrating on the other that you would have to deal with it. OpenMP does for does have a few things that aren't concerned with accelerators. Not many, to be honest, though. The vast majority of it was really uh, to make it work with accelerators. Uh, there are some, so a few other things in there that are nice. The most important one, I think, is the SIMD extension. I mentioned to you earlier on that vector uh, instructions, and I've mentioned a bunch of times that vector, vector things that, that are the reason that dependencies have been bad for decades and everything. Uh, these vector instructions, which the compiler you hope does for you automatically behind the scenes and the hardware implements. Uh, on the other hand, sometimes the compiler doesn't do such a good job there. So with OpenMP4, they've given you the, develop, the ability to control the vectorization a little bit more if you want to using the SIMD instructions. So uh, if you want to take a loop and make sure that it vectorizes properly or improperly, if you want to, you can really force the issue with these instructions. You can use OpenMP to control that. So that's where it started to decide to give you a little bit finer control over something that previously you were at the mercy of either the compiler or some non-standard extensions. So this is, uh, this is useful. All you basically have to do is declare that a function or a loop is SIMD, and then it'll force the compiler to, to vectorize that loop. Uh, OpenMP5, which isn't even, it's still it's nothing more than a, a, a glimpse of a standard. It's a technical report at this point, a proposal. However, the way that these, this committee has traditionally worked in the past, I have a very strong feeling it's just going to come to be. Uh, <clears throat> if you look at OpenMP5, it has a very, very new emphasis. So this gives you some important direction as to which way things are heading. Uh, and uh, its emphasis now is on specifying where things sit in various hierarchies in memory. It is now beginning to acknowledge that modern machines, you have different memory spaces, you have everything from SSD sitting out there to RAM to different levels of cache to high bandwidth memories which are the types of memories that are used in GPUs and accelerators. Uh, they have very, very high bandwidth but you usually don't have as much of them. So you have these hierarchies of things. We have a question, Steve? This is a comment. SM. SIMD equals single instruction multiple data. Yes, yes. So, so SIMD stands for single instruction multiple data uh, which in the not too distant past, people were obsessed with the taxonomy of parallel computing. And so you get MIMD computing and SIMD computing, and, and they, they, there are ways that you can break up how you're parallelizing things. Uh, it turns out that's less useful in the real world, and, and machines really have several useful configurations and lots of theoretically and academically interesting things that are useless. So SIMD th these days stands for vectorizing, vectorization. So. Uh, SIMD, single instruction multiple data. It means you have one instruction that works on a bunch of chunks of data and makes them all do the same thing. And a vector instruction in the CPU is basically saying, if I have, uh, if I have a vector of 50 uh, floating point numbers, another vector of 50 floating point numbers, and I want to add them all together, just a for loop is a way to do that, right? Well, there are also instructions in the machine that allow you to, to do those more efficiently. A single instruction that it says add all of these together in a vector register, which these days on the machines we're looking at is 512 bits wide. So you have 512 bits that can do simultaneous single or double precision operations, do a bunch of floating point operations at once. That's a SIMD instruction. And so from the programming perspective, it's just another for loop, a short for loop. Uh, from the hardware perspective, it's a way to save some cycles, one instruction to do a lot of operations as simultaneously as possible. Uh, in, the, in the real practical programming world, it's the kind of thing that vectorization has been doing for a long time to varying degrees, uh, but the, the technical term that's been rolled into uh, OpenMP is SIMD, because it's, it, that's another technical way we could, we could call it a SIMD, single instruction multiple data type of operation. But think of it as vectorization if you know what that means and you, you won't be wrong. So uh, to return to this point I was making here is that OpenMP5 is now obsessed with the fact that modern machines have a bunch of different data, uh, different hi a hierarchy of data storage. Moving data around is typically the most expensive thing in your code anymore. Long since the days of, of the floating point operations be being the dominant concern for performance are gone. You still measure how many floating point operations you can get through the machine because that's important. That's what you want to do science-wise. But the slowest point of the machine, uh, the part of the machine consuming the most energy, is not the floating point unit anymore. It's moving all the data back and forth from the one me from memory to a cache, to a different cache, to a register, back to the caches, back to the memory, maybe to some kind of non-volatile memory that's in the system. So 
uh, optimizing all of that stuff and making your code aware of it is what OpenMP5 is obsessed with. And so you can see here you have the ability for your data to specify your, your, your its uh, location in lots of different ways. Distances, you can say near or far, or bandwidth, high or lowest, latency. Uh, so you have lots of different ways to describe, even permissions actually in here. You have lots of different ways to, dis to describe where your data is. Uh, and that turns out to be uh, what, you know, not just what the OpenMP committee, but what lots of people think is the most important thing about programming in the future is, is keeping your data in the right place. So OpenMP5, that's its emphasis. Now, that raises the question again, is OpenMP4 moot now because uh, Intel has moved everything onto the same chip here. They don't want you to move things across a PCI bus. Uh, they want you to just use uh, OpenMP 3.1 type programming to, kit, to use it to, to uh, program all the devices. Uh, as a matter of fact, the most popular mode uh, by far at the moment for using the new night's landing is to take this high capacity memory and even though it has a relatively slow connection, this narrow connection to it versus its high bandwidth memory here, the idea is you program this thing like the high bandwidth memory is just a cache for the high capacity memory and you pretend that the whole thing is one big chunk of high capacity memory and you hope that the cache functions efficiently and that notion allows you to program everything like you're just in a big shared memory machine using OpenMP 3.1 like everything we've done today we don't worry about whether things are in cache or not right we just program the way things are in memory uh, that's the way that people are programming these night landing devices right now you have a couple different modes that you can program it in they're at a hardware level that's the most preferred mode. Now you might say, uh, if you think about that a little bit, it might be clear that there's some magic in there to say that this cache is effectively, that your 16 gigabytes of cache is able to fake like your 120 gigabytes, to give you some representative numbers, 120 gigabytes of your slow main memory. It can't do that, the cache can't completely fake this. You know, you've, there's a reason it's 128 gigabytes. There's more data than you can fit in here. So just having a cache is no magic fix for having 120 gigabytes of fast memory. You can't fake it perfectly or, well, that would be magic. So what's, uh, what's going on here? What's going on here is programming-wise, it's convenience. Efficiency-wise, it's costly. Turns out that at the moment that convenience is winning and people are really preferring to program these nice landing chips this way, uh, all the early literature, if so if you look at, and, and you should question this, and it may shift, so you should be aware of it, but if you look at all of the early applications people were excited about running on Knight's Landing, the vast majority of them at this point in time are running in this cache mode, uh, and most of the people acknowledge, you see in the papers, you know, yeah, we recognize that we should, we should try doing this a little bit more with explicit cache, uh, we could gain performance, but we haven't gotten around to it yet. And that seems to be the way things are going, is people are using the high bandwidth memory as a, as a cache. If, that's, if that remains the case, then OpenMP4 is kind of uh, moot, and that we program the things with OpenMP3, just like we've done all afternoon here. We might add in some of these OpenMP5 hints in the future to make things more efficient at guessing how it should cache stuff. But we certainly don't use these explicit memory management commands to move beta back and forth between these two memories, uh, which is what OpenMP4 is about. So we're in an interesting time here uh, with OpenMP4 just becoming useful on accelerators at the same time as Intel's roadmap is saying maybe, and Intel, and use it. So Intel made both options available. You can use it in cache mode, you can use it in not cache mode, and people are choosing cache mode. So uh, you can make a pretty strong argument at this point in time, it looks like OpenMP4 might not be all that popular moving forward. Okay. Uh, last thing to cover, all the things we didn't cover today and mention uh, that are, are notable to know about at least. Um, many of you may wonder about something called OpenCL, which is another way of doing tasking and threading, mostly for accelerators, matter of fact, exclusively for accelerators in the practical world. Uh, it, however, has greatly diminished support over the past couple of years, mainly because some of the things I've talked about here, which is that it was originally offered as an alternative to CUDA because people were uncomfortable with NVIDIA, CUDA, owning the whole universe of programming accelerator, so this was an, an open standard. However, with OpenACC becoming what's important to NVIDIA, they don't really care about the standard anymore. Intel, using OpenMP, doesn't care so much about OpenCL. AMD has their own vision of the future with this uh, HSA Fuse type architecture, and they no longer care about OpenCL. So OpenCL is a standard without industry support behind it. And unfortunately, industry support's critical for a standard that's working on the leading edge of accelerators and hardware. Uh, unlike, say, a compiler for x86, which changes over decades, and the open source community can, can support it and keep up with things, uh, this hardware is all 
depends upon device driver implementations, which change rapidly every year or less with new generations of hardware coming out. So the community can't support it very well at all without industry support, and industry support has largely evaporated. So I'm, I'm a little pessimistic on this. Uh, Fortran 2008 and on has threads in it, which are very sophisticated uh, in, many, as, in, in many ways, uh, a, a suitable substitute or competitor to OpenMP. Uh, however, a consistent implementation is still not there, and even though it's called 2008, and even though we're in 2018, uh, still not too many compilers that are fully 2008 compliant. As a matter of fact, only one that I know of that even claims to be. Uh, C++ 11 and on has threads uh, that are really basic, uh, but they're better than POSIX threads. On the other hand, they're nowhere near as nice as OpenMP. Uh, Python threads are completely fake in the sense that they, because there's a global interpreter lock, there's one of these lock things we've been talking about that sits in the middle of everything that Python does. So Python has a threading library, which is maybe a neat way to learn threading in a sense, oh, I made a code that runs right with threading, but nothing accelerates or speeds up because all the threads wait on this, this, this skill. So uh, don't expect performance out of threading in, in Python. Uh, direct compute from Microsoft uh, is not HPC oriented, but is their threading approach. Intel has a two different, very competing, and confusingly so, threaded uh, libraries to use, uh, threaded building blocks and Silk, uh, both of which are very usable and, and well supported and, and, and work well at what they do. Uh, they're very C++ oriented, um, but they're, uh, uh, again, they're competing with themselves and so they're breaking up the whatever mind share they already have. So uh, they're, they're useful, but I, I'd be hard pressed to say why I'd want to commit to one of these for a long-term project. Uh, and as a threaded programmer, though, if you look at them, you'll understand immediately what they're trying to do. And again, they're both they're very nice with C++. So these are all the things we didn't cover today, but I think I don't feel too guilty about uh, prioritizing OpenMP over them because OpenMP again sits right in the middle of what all of these try to do and is a well-supported standard. So you're not going to be you won't be cursing me five years from now that you invested in OpenMP for what you're doing. Whereas if you picked one of these here, you might very well be upset with whoever guided you down that path in five years, uh, which is always a concern in software. You always want to be looking ahead when you're starting an effort now. Okay, with that, I think I am done with what has been a very, very packed day. Uh, I want to make sure that we do credit uh, appropriately the people who made this possible here. Well, first of all, I'll point out there are plenty of additional learning resources out there if you want to continue on with this stuff. Uh, so and, and feel free to contact me if you've got questions and I'd always like to hear how well people are doing with what they learn here. 